Alright everyone, if you have not yet heard the news, our master class session with Grandmaster Elshan Muradi Abadi is going to start next week with master classes for 1600 plus Thursdays and future master class 1200 plus Sundays. I'm really excited for this master class session to start, but first, let us hear from the man who's behind these classes, who will be teaching those classes. I'll bring him onto the stage right now. So everyone, please welcome Grandmaster Elshan. Elshan, how are you doing today? Yeah, Alan, good to see you. Good to see How's you too. Um, I'm, right. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I see that you have a hat like mine, similar. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'm glad to see you uh, after uh, US Amateur Theme. And uh, I'm excited to start the classes. I will start this uh, Thursday and also Sunday. I will go for 10 weeks. And I'm thrilled to see the kids and all the participants in the classes. And I'm here with you. Happy to join. All right. So we will definitely get on to you, Sate, later. But first, let us get right into it. Let's start with the intro. So let me ask you. How did you first get interested in the game and what motivated you to pursue chess professionally? Well, um, so I learned chess in, uh, uh, in, 19, in 1992, I learned the moves that at the time I was nine, I was seven years old, uh, quite late with, with today's standard. If you think about it, I mean, nowadays kids learn just quite, uh, early uh, and, uh, it was it was it was relatively late to start uh, learning chess, but okay, at the time things were a little bit different. And it was only four years after chess, the ban on chess was lifted uh, in Iran, and the people could play chess again. Iran had a chess federation. It's back in Iran, when the, where I, where I was born and raised. So it was uh, it was a different diff different times. Uh, there was some uh, very little little material coaching, almost non-existent, and there was one coaching session once a week for two hours uh, that we had to drive for over an hour, hour 20 to get there for, for that. So that, that was, that's how I, I began. Hmm. All right. And then when I went, when I was looking you up and when I went to your webinar on Wednesday, which you did with your school, I noticed that you actually pursued an MA in statistics and were encouraged by lots of friends. We spoke about this before to go into quantitative roles. What drew you back into playing and coaching chess full time? Well, that's a, that's an interesting question. Yes, I actually went. Uh, so I was never a professional player, uh, Alan. So I um, I went to the best engineering college in Iran. Uh, it's called Sharif University of Technology. A lot of my classmates there graduate. They come to the to the United States or Canada, uh, pursue uh, graduate school, uh, master's degree, PhDs, and then uh, go into different professions uh, quite successfully, most of them. Um, and uh, that was the initial plan when I moved to the United States for me to get my PhD and uh, actually uh, go down that road, uh, probably academia at, at the time I was thinking. Um, I think I just love chess a lot and I love teaching. And I love to share my experience because one of the things in my life that I always had, uh, excuse me, problem with was finding proper mentorship. Right, Alan. I mean, we all want to have that one person who tells us not what to do, but how certain things are done, and what yeah. if you do if you if you pay attention to phenomena A and you do act B, it leads to C, and that's what we want to. Sometimes we want to have this kind of shared experiences with us in a more in depth way, and that's those are things I really missed in my own life and career as a both chess player or in, in, in a school, so. Uh, when I were to decide on something, uh, the meaning behind my work, that's why the, I love this job, is that I know it in and out, the way I describe things, or at least I believe so. <laughs> so, and and I and I enjoy sharing that experience with others. And when people come and ask me questions, I feel uh, it empowers me. It feels, makes me feel good. And I feel that I am returning to them. Uh, I, I get back to them. I, I share my knowledge and information and everything I know about the game and uh it makes me feel good it makes me feel satisfied yeah so this is actually a perfect segue into my next question which is how long have you been coaching and what are your biggest joys to see as a coach well that's uh that's an easy one so i started coaching 2004 i was 19 at the time 
Uh, but it was on and off. Like it wasn't exactly a lot of coaching because you see, I, I would distinguish between coaching and teaching chess. Sometimes you just teach chess. What do you think, Alan? What do you think uh, between teaching and coaching? What's the difference? Mm. So, what I is, think, so I think. So I think one of the two. I, so I think coaching is probably just lecturing and just trying to convey information, while teaching is more of like trying to make sure the student understands or interactive to convey a message. Um, I was thinking it's the other way around because when you coach mm. someone, you try to make them understand, you right. try to teach them how yeah. to fish on their own. And teaching is more uh, curriculum based. And, you know, I mean, you, you should probably follow a certain curriculum for both of them. But uh, I think in coaching, you are trying to make the person do the job on their own volition. Whereas in teaching, like in the school and everywhere else, is that you walk them from point A to point B, you show them how the walk is done. And they get to the point B with more information accumulated in a form of knowledge, hopefully, in, in their mind. So I've been teaching chess since 2004. I've been coaching since 2009. And that's when I was, I was coaching people to go to tournaments, play tournaments. So their emotions, their feelings, uh, their diet, everything that goes into a tournament became a, a subject matter as we were training as well and learning things uh, on the 64 squares board. So, uh, yeah, 2009 is the beginning of my coaching career, and I've been teaching just since 2004. Hmm. That is the background. And then what was the follow-up to the question? Sorry, the end of it, you were asking what... what uh, so what are your biggest joys as a coach? To shed, know that what I'm doing is right for that person because I thoroughly believe. when I, I wouldn't say anything until I'm sure about it. Hmm. Uh, so when I go, for for instance, when I go to the classroom and I share something, if I don't know, I just tell, tell them I'll get back to you. So when I share something, when I when I say something, I am so um, I have this affirmation in my mind that I, I I have I have this confirmation of my own understanding of the game that from what what I from where I'm standing, I'm looking at it, it looks like this. So that feeling that I am actually. And I'm that sure of myself that I am sharing this with, with 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 someone, and I'm helping them to move forward with their with their chess career and with their chess pursuits. Uh, it makes me feel good. It's a great satisfaction for me. Yeah, for me, even though I'm much younger, much less experienced, and I coach beginners, I try to do a similar approach in that when I coach my students, I try to make sure that they're able to completely do it on their own and they're able to apply it elsewhere. So that's why I like to push my students hard. I'm not sure if my students are watching the stream. I encourage them to come on to, to see the stream, but they know I like to push them hard, make them try to think a lot on their own. So that's more of my style as a coach. And I try to coach, not to teach, as he said. So now when you define your role as a coach, I know you, you mentioned it before, what we just spoke about, but can you explicitly define for the students watching, what is your role as a coach? Okay, here is my motto that is uh, omnipresent. It's all the time ready in the class, and that's my approach to learning chess. And anything, if I if I cannot claim I know anything better than chess, so I cannot. But if I teach anything, that this is my, 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 my main motto. Uh, I am here to teach you how to fish on your own, not to give you a fish. So, meaning that... If I, if I teach you to go from point A to B, if I give you a fish every day, you have to come back to me next day and say, okay, I need more fish to, to feed myself. Mm -hmm. But if I teach you how to how to fish on your own, then, th then you can go out there and achieve anyways. Yeah. And uh, that's a great feeling. I know every student of mine who graduates who stop working with me or they go their own path, I know they're going to succeed. And that's a great joy for me in my training. So when I... Uh, when I, when I have the kids coming to the class or any participant in my class, uh, I'm trying to make sure they, are, they get interested in the subject. And that's a very hard one because, you know, let's, let's just uh, uh, put it in a very, very blunt way. Training chess is not easy. Not that it is hard because chess is hard. No, because training in anything to try to get good at something, there is no reward right away. Like, for example, you can get good at chess by training, but until you go out there, play a tournament and actually use your knowledge, in a tournament, you cannot actually see the result. So you put many hours of training before even getting any result and getting anything. At least even in school, if you put time in your homework, you get an A for it or for your effort. Whereas in chess, 
it is hours of training before you get some really tangible outcome for it so uh it is you have to give a lot of credit to the uh, person who actually shows up every time in the class and tries to get good at chess and get them interested in the activity is very important because it's not that easy to remain interested in a task that the reward is very marginal compared to the amount of effort you have to put in yeah so it is very important to to maintain the interest and i would say the intellectual curiosity that's another 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 a two, my two word winner in in, in, a, in pursuing chess it, to to keep the heat uh, up and just the interest up in that intellectual pursuit because it is what it is the kind it is an intellectual pursuit and uh if you sit otherwise and if you just think about the result the amount of effort and the result it's not like school it's not like anything else it's like professional sport and you cannot come you cannot you, you know that not every uh, every person in the class can be a professional chess player because the amount of time you can put not everyone has that kind of a time to put into it so mm. to be your individual uh, independent thinker and to be to remain curious about that intellectual pursuit yeah for sure and when i play in tournaments i know i had that good result on your team at the team east tournament but in general from when i came from when i came back to chess till that point i didn't have any sort of breakthrough my rating maybe increased 100 points but it's been very stagnant but even despite that fact i really appreciate the intellectual curiosity where i'm able to go into so many games fight until the end and maybe just about lose even though my rating is stagnant I still really appreciate the intellectual curiosity and understand that maybe I won't get this reward. Like it's very marginal in terms of the time I put in teaching and analyzing my games, but I still really appreciate that part about chess. I'm able to play a really beautiful intellectual game. And if that's the case, obviously I'm a bad loser. I don't like to lose, but at least while talking to you, I can appreciate the fact that I played a proper game, intellectual game, which is really worth analyzing. So that's what I really appreciate about the game. So now Correct. I want to get so. Yeah. And sorry, Alan, I don't want to interrupt you. Just adding one more thing. Even I, being the coach, I am still the student of the game. You can never leave that uh, understanding of oh wait, uh, now I'm the coach. Even if you are a coach, you still have to study for yourself. It's very humbling. Chess is a very humbling activity. Yeah. And uh, once the student of chess, always a student of chess. To this day, if I don't improve my own chess, I cannot teach. I cannot become a better teacher. So it's 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 uh, it's an aggregate uh, it's an, it's an aggregate uh, effort of both coaches and students to make someone a better chess player. Mm. All right. So for the next couple of minutes, I actually want to step away from the chess, and I want to get to your role for what we call social empowerment, which you discussed social empowerment. On your website so on your website you discuss how chess is a tool for social empowerment and in fact you taught students from afghanistan who came to the united states after the taliban took over the government to teach them english through chess so as i'm playing this link as i'm playing this video right now that's posted on twitter nbc nightly news which you feature in can mm -hmm. you please elaborate yes so this was a very interesting one it was in raleigh it was back in 2022 and uh, I was approached by, at the time, the CEO of the USC, Carol Myers, that oh, there are these kids from Afghanistan. You know, I speak Farsi, and they speak Farsi in Afghanistan, so that is we have in common. And, uh, and uh, yeah, they just came uh, from Afghanistan, and, you know, Taliban took over, and their families were, like, engaged in, in the government, and they worked with the U.S. government at the time, so they, it was not safe for them, so they had to uh, leave and take refuge coming to the United States. And I said, sure, I would love to, I would love to help with, uh, with it. And I was like, okay, learning chess is one thing, but also having fun is another because these kids are like in cultural shock. They just kind of came to the United States, right? And uh, speaking English is, uh, I mean, understanding which is one thing, but connotations and all the all the meanings behind like the, the culture behind speaking English is another thing as well too. And that's that's an experience I as a, as an immigrant had uh, um, myself had it as well because. Uh, I came to the United States. Obviously, I did okay on my uh, on my tests. I got accepted into grad school. But when you, when I was talking day to day and speaking English, it was like, oh wait a second, there are certain things that I have to understand the connotations. This has negative or or positive connotation with it, and I have to 
kind of embrace these as everyday in everyday life as I learned and experienced it. So they come here, and this is what I love about just just is sort of a sort of an equalizer, Alan. You, when you when, when you come to the United States, if you are new, and not not only that, if if you are let's say not coming from a very privileged privileged background and your education hasn't been as as good as you want, what it does for you, chess, is an equalizer. It creates an equal chance for everyone to enhance something intellectual. Mm -hmm. It has a universal language. Everybody speaks the same language. The knights move the same everywhere in the world. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. The bishops, the the pawns, everything. All the rules are the same. Everyone plays the same game. And it has a language into it. It has an intellectual language into it. The pursuit, the strategy, the tactics, all of that. But if you come to the United States or you don't have the solid background in education, you cannot join the debate club. You definitely can join a chess club. And that's the beauty of chess being an equalizer, creating a chance. And chance means hope, and hope means pursuit. Hope means effort. Hope means doing things on a grand scheme. And that's what we want for everyone. That is that, that is the social empowerment. That means everyone in the society can feel empowered to do things through chess. And chess gives them the kind of the uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, I totally agree. So now this next question is important for me also. What do you think is the role of schools such as my school, International Chess Academy, and your school, Chess Evolve, in this movement of social empowerment? Well, um, we, uh, I mean, okay, International Chess Academy has been around for quite a long time, and I appreciate all the efforts that have been put in there, and my academy is uh, about one year old and we're new. But all academies, all efforts, all, all entities involved in chess in the United States, at least I can speak, is that by being supported by the chess community, we can give back, and we can create the chances, as we said, by the social empowerment, creating a better environment and better uh, uh, chances for everyone to pursue chess and, and get better. Remember, as I said, in Iran, there was no coach, no no, 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 pro, no program, nothing. I had whatever was there, I would go get. Even finding books was difficult. So imagine about the chances this can create for everyone. It, they have access to ICA, they have access to Chess Evolve, they have access to many other uh, platforms. There's not chess.com, chess civil, all of that. It's the chance that you know chess as a social empowerment uh, tool now has a lot of uh, labyrinth to 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 that, and it's it's a, it's a win-win with 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 the with this, with the chess community support for for entities like. ICA, Chess Evolve, uh, I don't know, St. Louis Chess Club, whatever you want to you mention that. Uh, all the entities involved with chess, we have a chance to give back, you know, the chance for creating tournaments to run um, math and chess activities, which I am big on, and that's for the future. I mean, not for now, but of course, I, I have some ideas about that in the future. And, uh, and uh, scholarships, events, opportunities for, you know, looking good on your resume so when you want to go i don't know to college application or for school application or anything else just creating a chance so it's a um yeah it's 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 a i call it a give and take it's just a win-win situation for all so we want to create the environment the chance for everyone and uh the support of the chess community would would empower us to do that in a, in a better way yeah so a little script before i continue this interview your answer actually made me think about the people that are underappreciated in the chess community, and that's tournament directors. I look at people like Noreen, Alessandro, Steven. Those are ICA tournament directors that direct in big tournaments like Team Easter Replayed, lots of school in New Jersey tournaments. So I think when it comes to facilitating this community, people can get together, play chess at a community level. Those people really have to be thanked and appreciated more. So thank you to our tournament directors. Yeah, uh, now, uh, let's try to take our hats off. Go ahead. Let's try to take our hats my off. Head, my headphones are blocking my hat. <laughs> my okay. headphones are on top. <laughs> okay. So I, I take my hats off to all the tournament directors and all the uh, people who yeah. are involved in running this difficult task. Not an easy one. Yeah. And if I had my AirPods, I would take my hat off, but I have to do it for now figuratively. So now let's get back to the interview. So... You were the coach of Iran's junior team back in 2011. In this role, describe the progression of your players, both as chess players and as people. Okay, um, so that's an interesting one. That's my, that's the only time I 
I was involved in that role as with the, with Iran because it was in uh, I think October 2011 and I immigrated to the United States in uh, January 2012. January January 18th 2012 to be precise. Um, so I uh, um, I had the four most hopeful players from uh, Iran in, in that event and my students ended up with the silver and bronze medal. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of, and two of them finished uh, on the fifth place, and they all uh, ha have successful life. Uh, if I mention it uh, one by one, uh, Huyai Danny became a grandmaster. Obviously, I only coached him for six seven months. I cannot take all credit for all of his success. He later on, became a world champion under eighteen, and they went on to uh, studies uh, medicine in Iran, but didn't pursue. And he's a professional chess player now, living in France with with with, with his family. And he's 2600 player. He won the Asian Games with Iran's team, which for me also was interesting because uh, the only medal of, in the Asian tournaments in Iran was won by me before that, back in 2000. Not won by me, me as one of the members of the team that won the, won the medal in 2006 bronze medal. So you feel that you kind of created the legacy that was pursued later on. Uh, Puya Idani uh, was part of the team uh, that won the gold medal. Now he lives in France. The two la young ladies uh, at the time now, they're all grown up ladies. Uh, Sarah Kadem and uh, and Dorsa Drakhshani, you know about Dorsa, she moved to the United States, she's now studying, uh, she's in the middle school, she's studying dentistry, and uh, uh, she became an IM later on, and uh, is now pursuing her education in the United States, quite successful, and the story about her uh, leaving Iran, it was all uh, international sensation, it was all around, and it was talked a lot about, uh, that I'm, I'm sure you've heard of, at least, Alan, have, have you, about Dorsa? I actually haven't. You haven't? Okay. Yeah, well, it was because she played uh, without hijab, and then she was banned from going back to Iran, and uh, then she moved to the United States. Uh, okay, Dorsa, yeah, uh, she was on the team, and Sara, she was. Uh, she, she went on to cross 2,500. Fide and uh, is, was at some point top 10 in the world. Uh, she immigrated also to Spain. Uh, she won the bronze medal in that event, and... Uh, I worked with her and Dorsa Dorsa from 2008 and sorry, 2009 and Sarah uh, later, later on a little bit for a few years. Uh, she went on from being a uh, higher, higher, higher 2000 rated player to, to 2300, almost grandmaster, one grandmaster level. And she went on to become an IM and so on uh, and almost 25, I mean 2500 FIDE. She lives in Spain now and she won this uh, women's uh, championship in Spain. And the other two, the, the last one, uh, Nima, she is now a PhD student in, uh, became an IM and uh, is a PhD student in Singapore. So as you can hear that it was quite a successful story. I cannot take credit for all of that. I can take credit for the performance in the tournament and I work really hard to prepare them and do uh, and help them do well. It's a pity they all didn't get med medals because there are only three medals in, in, each, uh, in each category. So they, they came very close, both Nima and Dorsa, but uh, hey, we did what, what we could do and they all went on to become successful kids so that is uh the story behind 2011 world youth in uh brazil hmm. so you are also the head coach of papua new guinness team in 2018 describe the connection you have with the country well the connection with the country goes back to the book uh what was it called again the book okay guns germs and still i think it's a book by, uh, it's an uh, uh, anthropology book by, uh, I forgot the author, uh, Guns, Germs, and Jared Stone. Diamond? Yes, yes. And that, uh, I've, I've heard about it, and then I was talking about, I was trying to get a job to be there so, I, so that I could introduce uh, my parents to someone. And then um, I was trying to be there. So... When the, when the opportunity introduced itself, I took it and I went to Georgia to coach the team. And we had a blast. It, uh, all the members we had a good time. They performed a little bit better than expected. And uh, it was an interesting experience. You know, they were not they were not all kids. They were all like, uh, yeah, that's the book. Uh, adults and uh, how to help them. Actually, um, um the, somebody wrote later on about it, and one of the success stories for our team was one of the one of the players who you know these are like uh, old, older players, right, adults, 
um, one of them went on to get FM title in, in the Zonal tournament. And this story is about him, actually, if I can share on chess.com. I shared it in the chat with you, if you want to share it with them, that I showed a trick, an opening trick to everyone, and it worked. And as it says in the story, it ran many laps and scored many points for our team, <laughs> which ended up helping this uh, guy, Sean Press, on the team to become a feeder master. All right, so I'm currently loading the link. But as I'm, as I'm loading the link, I'm going to ask you the next question. And once mm -hmm. I get it to work, then I will share the screen again. So in 2022, you won the US, US Open. From what I understand, your path to victory is not straightforward. You had several defeats in the same tournament in the years prior. So for me, the mentality, the mental aspect of chess, in my opinion, is just as important as anything on the board. Those things such as nerves, not necessarily trauma, but ex bad experience from pa past tournaments can affect the results in current and future tournaments. So describe how you're able to put those setbacks aside, reset your mind, and go on to win. Well, um, uh, uh, U.S. Open, uh, so um, I don't know. I don't, It may sound a little bit... Uh, a bit of a show off, but I always say about being a grandmaster, being being good at anything, is that you 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 begin searching, you begin pursuing a chance when everybody else quits. So I I cannot say I'm actually one of the top ones in that one because I haven't pursued chess as much in terms of a player as as uh, a lot of the other players have done. So I cannot just say that about myself. But but I always try to learn and come back. That is that is that is absolutely. That is a, that is an absolute fact about me. Um, so I, in the 2021 U.S. Open, I lost two games, including losing to one of my students, my first student in the United States, actually. And I ended up uh, withdrawing after uh, after uh, after round seven. Um, so going to the 2022, I went back to my original plan, which I had discussed with Grandmaster Shabalov. So Grandma Shabalov told me to win U.S. Open. The formula is this: you play the nine the nine rounds of schedule, you make plans prior to that, uh, eating good food and uh, and prep and rest the entire day and played like some of the European tournaments, which are one game a day, which nowadays are less often than before. Now there are more double rounds than ever. But so uh, I uh, once uh, my friend uh, Daniel from. Uh, uh, thinkers publisher uh, approached me and he said he wants to go for a one round a day tournament uh, for one round, uh, pretty much nine days scheduled tournament and uh, he's planning to go on site and do this in a few days early I was like sure I'm going to, I'm going to play I did my prep I spent uh, seven days on, on seven days on the west coast in, in uh, Seattle and then in uh, San Francisco with my friends just to get used to the time time zone and I did my chess prep and uh, just chilled get ready and then I went to the tournament with Daniel and uh, I was careful about my time of sleep my food everything and uh, this time I stick to my regimen with in everything and uh, went six all against all the opponents then I drew two GMs round seven and eight and the last round it was a crucial game against Grandmaster Ilya Nizhnik, against whom I have a bad result. Actually, up to that point, I'd never won a game against him. And, uh, well, he also needed to win. I was lucky about that because he needed to win to win a good prize money. And uh, I finally got my shot uh, when he tried too hard, and I uh, found a very strong counterplay in time pressure and managed to win and uh, tied for first and won the U.S. Open spot for the U.S. Championship 2022. Hmm. All right, so I was able to load the link. So can you guide me to what part you, you want me scroll, to go to? If you, go, if you scroll down all the way down, he explains a trick. And then that's Sean Press. It's, it's go up there, that's from Papua New Guinea. If you guys just scroll up a little bit, uh, the, the guy here, that's Sean Press, Fidel Master now, which he used a trick I taught the team of Papua New Guinea. If you scroll down and you'll see me, uh, he will have a photo of me if you scroll down. It's, it, that, that, that's, that, that trick is explained there. And that's me. There you go. And that, right. that uh, he, Sean told him that the trick I showed that I've I've told him that, and he already had used the trick, but it, it has run many laps and uh, it worked for the team. So the memory is that I showed the, I showed the one pony trick 
but he ran many laps and he scored many points for the team and for Sean. All right. So after we finish the stream, I will put the link to that. In addition to the link to the Twitter the Twitter page of your of your experience teaching the Afghan students that moved to the U.S., I'll put both of them in the comments. But right now, let us get into the nitty gritty, into the chess, which lots of people that may be interested in your class will definitely be curious about. So, for players who are only beating you today for the first time, please explain your coaching philosophy. My explain my coaching philosophy. So, uh, again, uh, going back to that, it all starts with uh, showing them how to fish on their own. In my coaching philosophy, I have a lot of focus on understanding concepts and trying to apply them because openings, ideas, moves, moves you can you can you can remember you can forget it can do anything to you but if you think in a proper direction the, the chances are even if you're not making the best moves the, the moves are optimal enough if you think in the right direction that it still keeps you in the game so always making healthy moves is very important so i, I emphasize a lot on evaluation and how to use evaluation before delve into calculation and that's the big that's the core of my uh chess training uh, in every aspect. Okay, I've, I'll talk about prophylactics, comparison, uh, evaluation, minor piece comparisons, weakest scores, all of those things people have heard. But the core and essence of it is that uh, how to apply our understanding of the position to choose the proper candidate moves that as we, we calculate through them, even if we don't do the best calculation, we still choose moves that keep our position healthy and keep us in the right direction in the game. Pretty much be a good practical problem solver. All right. So my next question is, when I'm looking at your curriculums, which I will show later, mm -hmm. it's a little bit of a pointed question. I noticed no explicit mention of tactics. Why is that? Yes, because tactics is, again, like I said, uh, I used the word earlier, is omnipresent, is everywhere. You cannot ditch tactic and say, I only think about my evaluation and then make a decision based on that. Sometimes you do. But even when you do that, that means you've done some calculation, which is inconclusive, and now you just are trying to uh, hedge your bet on uh, on a move that was among those calculated moves. You're just not as sure, so that you use your intuition to choose that move. So calculation is always present in in your work. You cannot detach calculation from your uh, from your game. In fact, there was a there was a, there was a conversation a few days ago about. Grandmasters, chess players, all of that. And you were talking about being good strategist chess players and, and generally chess players. And I said, no, we're we are great problem solvers. We are good at strategizing too, maybe better than average. But what stands out actually is that we can apply short-term tactics to a longer plan. So for instance, you play Sicilian opposite side castle and you know you have to attack on the queen side as black and you white attacks on the king side. Well, that's the general strategy. But we are good at, I'm talking chess players, I'm not talking about just grandmasters. We are good at juxtaposing few uh, ideas, go about, execute a short-term plan, maybe get advantage, maybe get initiative, maybe get ahead of just a little bit, and then go to the next phase of doing things. So piggybacking on the previous one. So it's a, it's a piggybacking of many tactics on, on the back of one each other. So going forward. So um, yes. Short-term problem solving because nobody can execute a plan of 20 moves nowadays. Not in life, not in chess. So it's a very important one. So tactic is is just part of it. it you cannot just do it separately. So it is embedded. Mm. Yeah, again, I appreciate the references and the comparison between chess and life. And I guess one of the reasons why I always get myself into time pressure and the reason I crumble into time pressure, I even asked you on your own stream on Wednesday, I was the one that asked for people that are for, like, if I'm bad on the time pressure, how do I like improve that? So I guess one of the reasons why I struggle is because every single move for me from start to finish is based on calculation rather than, I guess, evaluation. So in that case, I really see where you're coming from and how you, how a lesson from you could benefit in terms of focusing more on evaluation rather than just calculation and tactics, because I guess that's just where my mind is geared towards. And again, the comparison versus chess and life. Again, I see it. It's really important. I love the analogy where you can't calculate 20 moves ahead in life, which we always try to do, but there's so many twists and turns. 
Uh, as they say, man plans, God laughs, huh? <laughs> man plans, God laughs. I love it. All right. Yeah. So up on the screen now, I have your curriculum for the future master class, which is 1200 plus. So mm -hmm. walk us through what you want your students to get out of this class. So on my website, as you may have seen, I've talked about my method of nine imbalances, which is about evaluation. And uh, the, the, uh, the top four you've put there, opening principles and fundamentals, I call them the four golden rules of the opening and fundamentals of chess, king safety, development, space and center. And I replace initiative, which is a trade off between time and material uh, instead of just putting material. And these are, these are the very important ones for 1200 players because they, they have problem coming out of opening for, in, into, uh, into a healthy positions. And a lot of time they end up just memorizing a lot of moves, thinking that these are the moves they have to make without thinking about but uh, how to play their games. And I see they can grow players to 1,200 all the way to 1,600. And then they play their games as sometimes I look at their games and I'm like, hey, you, what are, what are you doing? Uh, I'm just making up a name, John, or I don't know, Alan, what, what is this? <laughs> You're just doing your own thing and your opponent's doing his own thing as well. And then it, it turns out that it turns out that, uh, you're not paying attention to, I mean, you're just making your moves and your opponent is making your, their moves. Then you're not really looking at the interactions between your ideas and the frictions it creates and the, the challenges. And uh, I realized if you learn to think independently, again, using these cues instead of just the moves you've been instructed to play, then you'll be able to show your opponent's mistakes during a game. And by doing so, then you can get ahead from your competition then you can get to the 17 1800 level players where you know how to if your opponent weakens the structure how to take advantage of that and so many other uh aspects of opening uh features which these four encompass and the fundamentals middle game concepts bishop pair advantage you have to know how to play open positions with bishop pair good knight versus bad bishop you have to be able to to compare your minor pieces and uh, weakest scores and outposts it's pretty much targeting and important end games. Uh, I would, I, I didn't want to use the word fundamental because I may or may not use fundamental positions, but what I want to show them is that, uh, if you, if you think about it in the rook end games, there are many positions that are not exactly filler positions, but they can transpose or they don't transpose, but they can be different version of it. So there, uh, there are all kinds of uh, tricks involved in it. Hmm. So, so now I'm going to ask you the exact same question, but this time for the master class, which is 1600 plus. Again, what do you want your students to get out of the class? So I, I'll start with the evaluation. I'll discuss that. I'll show them examples of it and uh, using my nine imbalances. Of course, not all of it in one class, but to the to the uh, to the best to the extent of which I can share that with them. Then I tell them how to apply that to their calculation, and uh, because a lot of time people calculate the right line. But they fail to see if the outcome of, of their calculation is good for them or not. So they have to learn to see that in their head and not only visualize the final position, but understand be, being able to evaluate that final position, if that's good for them or not. Then prophylactic thinking. And prophylactic thinking, I mean, uh, we know, of course, from the Wurski, but all, all along, that's the, uh, that's the foundation of playing good chess, that you deny your opponents from doing what they want to do, and enabling yourself to do is achieving a few things along the way. Because of the zero-sum nature of the chess, uh, if you can do something, that means your opponent cannot do something. So that's the zero-sum nature of the game. It's being discussed there. Then process of elimination. That is pretty much just for your confidence. Not, not just that, of course, it's, it's a form of calculation. Um, process of elimination is that uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mask math concept. This is in set, set theory, Alan. If you cannot find A, if you find A prime and deduct it from the universal uh, set, then you can you, have, you find A, right? Yes. So here yeah. is that we find A prime. And once we find A prime, that means that we have all the bad moves. That, that what's left is are the good moves. So comparison, uh, you want to execute plan A or plan B, uh, plan A. You know you want to execute plan A, but you have two options to do that. Rook AD1 or Rook FD1. Which Rook? So that's where it is. Brute force is visualization, pretty much. You want to see that. That's where you get the most of the tactics done, pretty much, on, on the brute force. Mm. Simple chess. Okay. That's the part that it gets funny because in simple chess, uh, 
people say, oh, but that's boring. Why should I make this move? The position is balanced. I want to create imbalance. I want to make my opponent make a mistake. But you, you know, I will show a lot of my games that I make simple moves. And uh, I think you watched some of uh, one of my games that was that went to the end game. I won the game, Alan. If I don't know if you watched it on, on my Wednesday show, my Wednesday seminar, where uh, where it was a very simple end game, and I gradually just exerted pressure, and my opponent just succumbed to the pressure. So the art of learning to make good moves without thinking about the outcome, and you just gradually improving your position, taking away your opponent's play, and at the end you end up with a better position. Rook endings. It, it is self self explanatory and defensive mechanisms just uh you have to learn that sometimes you are worse and you have to play for a draw that's something that people don't learn in a, for a long time i have i know 20 to 2300 players they don't know how to defend their positions that's so surprising so the earlier you learn it the better you just learn the mindset that when it's time to defend the position hmm. all right so thank you so much for that so what i'm going to do right now is i'm going to load a game that i've played in the in the competition that I spoke about, the US State US Amateur Team East Tournament. This is a tournament in which, again, very I played in the first round as an alternate on the same team as Elshon. And this was, I think it was a pretty good game. So I'm just currently loading it up and I'm going to share my screen because it's on a different tab. So let me present, share screen. Is it this one? That's this one. I just cannot make a move. Can you make? Can you make it possible for me to make the move? I thought I let you know. Uh, I thought I gave you permission to. You can't move on here. I am. I am in here, but. Uh, yeah, we're in classroom, and I gave you permission. Yeah, I, I I see the game, but it doesn't let me to make a move. Hmm. Uh, All right. What if I send you the PGN right now, and you can load it up in your own game? So let me leave and join again. Maybe maybe this works. Uh, uh, can you? Can you? Let me just see. All right, Elson, join again. Uh, can you give me the link to? Like, I have to go to uh, learn, and you said what lessons or no analysis? Learn classroom. A uh, classroom. Yeah. Uh, it says you have to give me the room ID. All right, I'll just kick you out, and I'll let you join again. Okay, now now I see. All right, and now. All right, make a move. Okay, now it works. Okay. All right. Okay, let's do Perfect. it. Perfect. Let's do it. So, so uh, here's a question number one for you, Alan. Do you play E4 against C6 or what? I think, are you generally an E4 player or a D4 player? So, honestly, I like both E4 and D4. I've been becoming more of a D4 player lately, but all my life I've been playing E4 until recently I discovered D4. But yeah. I'm somewhat comfortable with both. I can be better in both. I like both. Okay. All right. Um, sounds good. I would say stick to one in general, but okay, you play the system. E5 and uh, okay, advanced. I like advanced. Uh, it's it's a good system. You can grab space. I like that. Bishop of five, knight of three. E sticks, bishop D3. So why, Alan, I don't like this move, bishop D3? When I play bishop d3 right away, you don't like it? Yeah, I, I don't like the move bishop d3. Why do you think I don't like the move bishop d3? Hmm. So, let's see, bishop d3. So, you see, uh, in French defense, yeah. let's uh, make some moves. Do you, see, do you see my moves? Yeah, I see it, yeah. And if everyone sees five, it. This bishop cannot, cannot get to a five, right? Yeah. So, um, now we we have the same in the in the actual game in the actual game we have the same structure his bishop is out and you're trading his bad bishop pretty much his bad french french bishop that's why you're mm. better off to move bishop e2 
and then you want a castle and then you, you want to attack this bishop later ah uh, all right with like moves like for example knight to, you know, like you want a castle yeah then something like knight, knight h4 four. after and then but not right now but eventually yeah uh, g4 yeah maybe so um so that's why i don't like bishop d3 so but bishop d3 was played okay 97 bishop g5 queen b6 i have no problem with move b3 uh maybe you don't need that move but that's okay h5 take on seven do i like that move bishop 67 you think so i don't think you would because my bishop does seem pretty strong here mm -hmm. yeah but at the same time I believe that his knight did have more potential to get stronger, yeah, especially so, now we maybe, go to f5. Maybe this is a, uh, an option. I don't know if this is a good move or not. Probably not a good move because he can go c5 and attack your center. Uh, but just just castle first would have been nicer. But because bishop b7, yeah, you don't you don't get much. But okay, castle. He plays c5. Okay, now you should have advantage. If you look at my under two, 1200, uh, sorry, not under twelve hundred plus curriculum, you would understand why you have advantage. Maybe. And you know the engine may disagree, but that doesn't matter. What matters is what, what's our understanding of the position. Uh, here again, you shouldn't play that. I think you should castle first. But even here, you are slightly better. But this move is not a good move. No, this is not a good move. What's, what's the better move to play here? So a better move to play. Do I go now for the c4 break, or or knight bd2? Uh, okay. I'll, I'll look at look at the curriculum. Look at the curriculum. I, yes. I extended the curriculum. What are the four things? Uh, development is very important. You have to open the game with a move C4. Capture, 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 capture. And now you have a space to play. You, you, you are a little bit ahead in development. You are the first one to come along here. Oh, sorry. I went to E4. So you see, because he has to lose one tempo, it's very, it's going to be very hard for your opponent, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so you played knight c3. And I don't like this move either. You, he's not castled, right? That means that uh, having the queens on the board presents uh, your opponent with some difficulty, right? Hmm. So it's better to not do that. Maybe play knight b5 right away. And then from knight, b, from knight b5. So knight b5. And then yeah, in the future. Here, what? And then here with the idea of playing c4 maybe. Your queen can always come over here. We're coming to c1. And we're coming to d1 trying to open the game. Hmm. You see, when it castles, you, the presence of your queen makes makes life difficult for your opponent. What was the question again? So you mentioned knight b5 right away. So for knight, for, so if I were to go knight b5, what would be the future for that knight? Where would it go after? And makes then sense. after, if you were to defend it, perhaps with a bishop. With a bishop, then maybe we have moves like this. Hmm. And then, all of a sudden, your opponent really starts to feel the heat that, oh, he's not castled. Because if he goes here, then you have 96 check, right? Yeah. And then, six, six. And then, now, yeah, he has take the here. And then you can maybe take here, knight c6. Then you take on c6. Or, again, play rook c1 with c4. You have to open the game. Because he's he has got, he's got a solid center. You have to challenge that center. Ah. Uh. So, uh, nice c3 was played. Now, now he's got pressure on, on, the, on your opponent's c2. He's making good moves, your opponent. I think you should try to play moves like a4, a5, a little bit pushing this knight away and making some weaknesses here. Bishop c5, c3, there, f4. Maybe f3 would have been nicer because then you can maybe take and then, oops, sorry. Maybe take and then opening this rook, huh? I was thinking more like f4, f5, and open the rook that way. Well, but that costs you tempo, right? 
You too? Mm -hmm. And this is actually what happened in the game. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there. Now you're in a good shape. Now you're in a good shape. F5. And maybe a bit hasty. Maybe just rook c1. Capture and g3. Then you can you can you have to find a way to place this knight over here, for example. Maybe to play uh maybe like this, maybe go rook e1. There, knight e1, knight here, 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 and here. And then you can go from there to this is square or this is square, huh? Yeah, you could. yeah those are good apples, especially e5. Yeah, but instead you just went head on with this. I also understand you are trying to make it draw because, uh, oh, I know you blundered here. I think if you just go here, there's no way for your opponent to play for a win. Hmm. So he doesn't have any breakthrough. Hmm. You can place the king over here and then play your maneuver over here. But then I think you knew that you are getting close to a draw against the higher opponent. So you, that's where you went wrong and you give his king a lot of activity. In the end game, especially knight end games are like pawn end games. That's what, what Phoenix said. And uh, in this kind of cases, it's very important for you to get your uh, to get your king active, and your king is not active now. So then, you are in some trouble because I want to get to the, your glory moment. So I, I want to go a little bit faster here. This, this, and this is completely winning for your opponent, I think, at this point. Yeah. Like here, over here, knight check, king f two. There, capture, capture, g five, and here. Did you check this with the engine? So I did check it with the engine. There was a point. I think once the king started going for the for the pawns, at that point it was a dead draw. Yes, but this very position is winning, right? Uh, let me just turn on the evaluation. Yes, right now black is winning, clearly. Yes, black is clearly winning. And then he goes yeah. there. Yeah, this is the wrong plan. He needs to use his king. He needs to use his king to do this. That he tried to to stop the pawn. Instead, he goes for a counter, and then and now it's a dead draw. Now it's a draw. Now, now yeah. you play all correct, and then and it's 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 at one tempo. I, I like that because he cannot play a four here because you actually win. And you promote with a check. Yeah. That wins the game for you. Yeah. So. And and then I could see the thrill on your face that this will this saves the day for us because uh, you knew you got a draw, and uh, now if he goes knight h six, you just go king here, and then that's going to be just a draw, and that was a great save. How what was your opponent's rating in this game? I think seventeen hundred, and that's like four hundred points above you, right? Uh, three fifty about, but yeah, close enough. Yeah, that's a very great save, and uh, um, there was a lot of lessons in this one. Trading the bishop wasn't good. Uh, you had to not trade the queens as well. Pawn structure, because you're in a bad pawn structure, your C pawn was weak and yet pressure along the C file. But all along, what matters is that you, you try to make healthy moves, and that matters a lot. And I really like that about the way you play the game. And you fought till the end. You re realize that you know you cannot quit for on your G pawn. And then the moment he gave you the chance, you, you found the counterplay, and you did quite well. Yeah, so guys, the... hats off to Alan. He saved the day for the team because round one we didn't have our board three, one, one of the strongest players in our on our team. So we ended up our, our team with three wins and three draws, not losing a single match. And given that uh, one of our players wasn't at his at his best, we did pretty good uh, overall. So we didn't concede this uh, uh, team loss, which was important. Right? We played some. Hundred, over 100 points stronger teams than ourselves so that was that was quite 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 an achievement for our team um all right all right anything else alan so anything else so before we go i want to give a moment for the audience if you have i want to give you guys a moment to ask elshan any questions you might have about anything so keep in mind there is a 10 second delay delay in the stream so let's give it some time to see if they do have any questions for us. All right. Anyone? 
Any questions? Any questions for Elshan? All right, we have a question. I'm actually surprised they have a question, but now we have two questions. Let's start with the first one. What is a good black opening against one D4? That takes white out of theory. I'll answer that myself. The, the Benoni, I love the Benoni. <laughs> well, actually, that game I covered, uh, I would call it Malachov uh, Drift System. G6, E6, and sometimes you go to Hippopotamus, Hippopotamus, or sometimes you play Knight, E7, D5, black. Bishop goes to G7, Knight, E7, D5. That is the one that gets really black out of the theory, and Thinkers Publisher has a book by Grandmaster uh, Ipatov, who covered that opening in his book. So the opening is wrong if your opponent knows what they are doing, but uh, for the most part, people don't study that opening and it, it gets quite interesting. Okay, that's question number one. Question number two, should I study opening, tactic, or end game? You should study all of them, but it depends on your rating. But if you are less than 1600, you should study tactics and end game. All right, we now have a question from one of our players who was at a tournament today, Super Chiburashka or Ido. Ido asks, how many Sicilian variations should I learn to keep my opponent from having good preparation? Depends on the Sicilian you play. If you're studying Nidorf, you have to study all of the Nidorf. If you're playing Taimanov, you have to know the opposite side castling really well. Other than that, that's that's what this for Taimanov. If you want and to... He- if you want to minimize your effort, uh, I wouldn't know what to say, but uh, stay away from Richter Rouser. You, you cannot play Richter Rouser unless you have a deep, deep understanding of the opening. It's a quite risky opening. So, Ido then followed up to you by saying... We're getting so many questions, I can't click. Ido said, I'm 1830, I played Simano Sicilian, I'm learning Schwenningen. Schwenningen, yes. Schwenningen. No, it's not Schwenningen, I think it's... It's Schwenningen because it's a it's a it's a uh, Dutch place. Uh, that's perfect. I think he's doing the right thing. I think for his rating, that's that's a good opening. Just just learn the opposite side castling really well, and also the Tal's idea with f4, bishop b3, f4, queen f3. That one too. All right. We now have a question about the class, which I just got a text from Diana saying, "Do not miss it." So I'm not gonna miss it right now. Question about the 1600 plus class. Is it suitable for students over 1850, or will everyone be 1600 and 1700? So I'll actually, I'll let Elshan answer, but I'll answer myself first. So it is definitely suitable for students over 1850. With our current master class right now, with Irina Levitin and Alex Stupunski, our two grandmasters, lots of our students are actually in the 1800, 1900 range. So it is most definitely suitable for students over 1850 in that range. So Elshan, you want to add? Uh, I would say up to 2,000, they can they can benefit from this class. It's it's a challenging class, so up to 2,000. Probably over 2,000, it's getting not as challenging for them, but up to 2,000, they should be fine. Hmm. All right. Now I have a little bit of a funny question. Mm-hmm. If you have failed to ladder mate someone, what strategy would you really recommend? Learn the ladder mate. <laughs> I agree. Learn to ladder mate. Don't lose. Don't blunder your pieces because if you're in ladder mate, it means you're down material. All right. Next one, Elshan. What is your favorite opening? Uh, I I am a I'm a GM. I am working with people of different level. I have to know every opening. I love all of them. But um, if I play well, I like to play e4. I like my opponent to play Sicilian. I like to play opposite side castling if I can. Hmm. All right. So we don't have any more questions. I'll give it another 20 more seconds because of stream delay. Stream delay is 10 seconds plus 10 seconds for people to formulate their questions. So I'll give 20 seconds. And if we don't have any questions, we'll wrap it up. Okay. Oh. And? Do you like the London? No, I don't like London, but played. It's it's an efficient opening. I hate London, mm. but played. That's okay. I teach my students mm. to play London too, but I hate it. Mm. You know, I've been to England. I've been to London. I stayed there for three weeks. I love the city. It's a beautiful city. As for right. the opening, as for the opening, 
there was a time when I played it, and now I play a strange variation, which all High Rider players love to make fun of me. But I like the London, and I love the city. Alright, so... I think this is good for questions. We're at the hour mark. So, Elshan, do you have any final thoughts before I give mine? I'm looking forward to see everyone in the classroom. Um, we're gonna have a lot of fun, and I would, I would hope, I hope that uh, people come with open mind to be challenged and uh, be open to uh, work hard because work hard always pays off. And I hope they are gonna have fun those who are joining the classes. And otherwise, they they can find me through the ICA or they can contact me at chess at uh, gmlshan.com, which yeah. I'll be happy to get back to to them uh, on their questions. Yeah. So I'll give my closing thoughts, but first, you actually got one more question. What is the biggest tournament you have participated in? I have played in the World Cup, twice. Hmm. All right, so now my closing thoughts. So I so I met El Shana Team East. I had a dinner with him, so I spoke with him before. And then I went to your seminar on Wednesday. But I think today, what I really liked about my conversation with you was not just hearing the chess about you because the chess is at the very end. You giving me lots of constructive criticism for my game, but more about the human side and what we call social empowerment, how you have used your position as a grandmaster, as a really strong player to help others in need. So I think that for me is really important how you're able to constantly connect chess and your background on chess to life. And I think that whoever does come to your class, which I hope will be lots of people after this interview, they'll be able to see not, you not just as a strong chess player, but as a human and as a coach that can help them in chess and in other aspects of life as well. I hope so too. Thanks, Alan, for the kind words. And I hope that is uh, that will be what they take from the class, not just chess lessons, but life lessons and things that they make them feel better about themselves and their chess at the same time. All right. So I will see you soon. Thank you so much. See everyone on Thursday. Thank you.